Hi everyone, I'm Carlota Pico from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here today with Aoife Noon, who is social media marketer and founder at Babushka Social, and has over 15 years of experience in marketing and communications. Welcome Aoife, and thank you so much for joining us today on The Content Mix. I'm delighted to be here, Carlotta. Thank you for having me. Me too. I can't wait to hear more about Babushka Social. Okay. Eva, could you tell me a little bit about your background and what led you to where you are today? Sure. Um, so as you mentioned in the intro, I've got over 15 years experience in marketing communications. Um, so I actually started out in general marketing, which is a bit more of an unusual route into social. And then over the last five years, I have specialized in social media. And that's really where I found my, my niche. Um, I think it's really the, the shining star amongst all the other marketing channels that there are out there. Um, after having worked within corporate environments for pretty much all my career, I've now started up my own social media consultancy and training company. Okay, excellent. And, and is that Babushka Social? Yes, yeah, so that's Babushka Social. Um, I, I feel like I should explain the name. Yes, please. <laughs> um, well, as we were talking before we came on air, um, Carlotta, I think really for me, one of the things I find both interesting and challenging in equal measure in social is probably the lack of understanding there is both among marketers and uh, sales professionals around what social is and the power of social. Um, and it got me thinking really of the Russian doll analogy, how on the outside it's it's one thing, but then when you start peeling away the layers and, and getting closer and getting under the skin of something, so to speak, you start to disco discover kind of hidden depths. Um, and that's really the power of social. When you start to familiarize yourself with the channel, um, expose yourself to best practice, um, get some training on social, you really start to discover it can do a lot more than what you possibly yet had first um, realized. Mm -hmm, definitely. Now, Aoife, are you specialized on certain channels? Um, not specifically, but I think by way of my interest, um, I tend to focus and serve mostly B2B clients. Mm -hmm. And with that comes an emphasis on LinkedIn being the number one B2B social media platform and also Twitter. Um, and as I've just alluded to, I have a, a big passion really for, for training and learning. Um, I, I strongly believe every day is a school day. And that's one of the reasons um, I'm in social media, because it's constantly changing. Um, and I love to share that knowledge with other people, because, you know, as they say, knowledge is power. And that's really what gives people um, the tools and the confidence to be able to, to achieve more with, with their own marketing efforts. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so I am going to focus obviously on social media throughout this interview because that's your area of expertise. And also, since you're the founder of a social media company, well, I think it's appropriate to go down that route. So what do you think separates good social media marketing from great social media marketing? Um, I would say a couple of things. I think one is to really know your audience. Um, and again, it probably sounds simpler than what it is to actually achieve. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to deliver the content that meets your audience needs and is driven by the audience rather than being primarily driven by the business goals or the corporate agenda. That's not to say that they're not important. Of course they are. But I think if you really follow your audience needs and deliver on those needs, then you're going to achieve your business goals. Um, and that comes back to my earlier point about education and understanding around how social works. Um, I think the second thing would be is to probably show some personality. And that is particularly, I think, an important point in B2B, where there tends to be a reticence to do so, whether it's because the brand themselves doesn't have a particular tone of voice or the tone of voice is quite staid and vanilla. Um, and also where you need to consider the difference between the content you put out in the name of your brand versus the content that is put out in the name of your employees. Um, but ultimately, they're promoting your brand and, and your business. And I think certainly since COVID, we've seen more humanization and personalization of B2B content and B2B platforms such as LinkedIn. Mostly a good thing. In part, I would say there's people that probably take that a wee bit too far because at the end of the day, it's still a B2B platform. Um, but I think that humanization is, is a really positive aspect. Um, and also where, where you even consider using entertainment as, 
as a communication uh, option as well. I think that that has its place in B2B, obviously used appropriately, but I would say it's absolutely worth considering. Okay, what about copying social copies across all the different social channels? Do you think that's an appropriate way of working social channels? So it's like one size fit all. So for example, what I post on LinkedIn, should I also post that on Instagram and also post that across other channels? Or should I tweak my messages according to the different pub audiences? You should absolutely tweak to the audience because I think, again, maybe it's, it's, it's a poorly understood fact or something that, that in the heat of the moment, in the rush to get content out, um, it's not considered enough. But I always say to people, people go to those platforms for different reasons. Mm -hmm. The profile of the audiences that are on those platforms is also different. So you need to reflect that in your content, both in terms of what you're putting out by way of what content and also how you're putting it out in terms of how it's written and also the format to the tour de creative um, that you use. And if you take the time to do that, which isn't always easy because you know, I've been in the, in the end of it where you're working against so many deadlines and, and conflicting priorities, it is a difficult thing to do. Um, but I think where you do spend the time and make the effort to do that, you will see it bear fruit in the results. Okay, Eva. how do you think uh, networking has changed from pre-COVID-19 times to post-COVID-19 times? That's a really good question. I think, um, you know, we're still working our way through it because I think if we reflect on where we started with this crisis, I know I'm thinking about the conversations I have with, with colleagues um, at the start, we all thought we'd be back, you know, in an office environment a few months later, you know, drinking PIMS or, you know, glasses of Prosecco on a sun terrace. And it hasn't worked out that way. So I think really, that I'll draw out some positives because I think it's important to, to bring out positives in these situations. Um, I think it is kind of forced, in inverted commas, um, people to network online where, particularly in sales roles, they would have been used to doing that networking face-to-face, -face, going out and, and meeting prospects and clients. And I think with that, there has been a, tremendous spike and increase in the number of webinars available i mean if you wanted to you could probably spend every hour of your working day <laughs> attending webinars um and i think you know if you choose the right webinars that's a really valuable way to spend your time um to to kind of improve your your knowledge um but also i think specifically on networking um there's quite a lot of online groups available where you can network with peers and prospects, um, certainly within the marketing world. One that I really value is the marketing meetup, which is run by Joe Glover. Mm -hmm. um, now he's stopped it for, for the month of August um, for summertime, but hopefully we'll re resume in, in the autumn. Now that was a massive face-to-face -face networking group pre-COVID, but it has pivoted to being a, an online forum and he runs a regular program of webinars. Um, so I think the second point I'd make is Coming back to LinkedIn, I think LinkedIn at its heart, it's a networking platform. Um, and I think pre-COVID salespeople obviously were making use of, net, of networking on LinkedIn, maybe some to lesser or greater degrees. But as I said, given now, we don't have those options to go out and network face to face. It's become even more important to master the skills to use LinkedIn effectively for networking. Um, and to really, I suppose, add value in the way that you do that as opposed to approaching LinkedIn with a kind of a sales first mindset. It's really, I was at a conference um, earlier in the summer, a B2B conference, and they were talking about how it was really, in many ways, is trying to teach sales professionals to adopt a marketing mindset. Um, and it was kind of around that that sort of S was dichotomy where actually in the sales world, we're asking salespeople to become more like consultants um, and there was the phrase consultative selling was, was coined and I think it is very relevant because what people are looking for uh, when they come to social platforms and a platform like LinkedIn they're looking for value and they're looking to to really benefit from the time spent on that platform. I completely agree with what you were saying I mean I still I'm in Madrid right now and um, at the moment we're not on lockdown but we were on lockdown for several months and uh, when the world opened up again to us. I was walking along my street, my neighborhood street, and I kept on seeing signs all across the local shop saying, we'll be back next week. And I was like, yeah, next week, few months later, <laughs> we're finally back. This is it, and it's, it's so difficult. And I think I'll, I'll just 
chuck in a couple of additional points on, on networking. Um, I think on LinkedIn, uh, what's really interesting to me is that it's grown in terms of its use throughout uh, th this crisis. But notwithstanding that, I mean, only a small fraction of uh, their active users actually share content on a weekly basis on LinkedIn. Um, you know, so LinkedIn has 310 million monthly active users, but apparently only 3 million are sharing content on a weekly basis. So I think that gives you, if you're looking or watching this, listening to this podcast as a marketer or as a sales professional, it shows you the huge opportunity there is there to, to do more on LinkedIn and to really take advantage of the situation whereby you have been effectively forced to, to root your outreach efforts towards digital channels. Um, I think the second point I'd make is more orientated towards smaller businesses. As you were saying, you know, when you walk out in the high street and you see businesses that are saying, hey, we'll be back soon or temporarily closed. I think it's really thinking about the role of social. I think in particular, I have to give a shout out to Facebook as a platform that have been active in supporting small businesses and really innovating their platforms to make it easier for small businesses and also consumers of those businesses uh, to shop on those platforms. But it's even simple things like I'd say to small businesses to use social as a way to listen to what their customers are saying. So for example, if you run a store and there's conversations happening in your community on say Facebook groups where people are saying, oh, I'm not gonna go back to that store because the odds are too narrow or people weren't wearing face masks or whatever it is that made them feel uncomfortable, then you've got a great opportunity if you're tapped into those conversations to go, okay, right, we need to do something about this mm -hmm. and being able to respond to that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really, elevated the role of a social listening as i mentioned but b the role of communications to give businesses small and larger the maximum opportunity to be um adapting and meeting their customer needs and pain points during this crisis i've seen a lot of brands and just a lot of people posting on their social media channels every second every single second of every single day and i want to ask when is it too much? When is content too much content? Because there's a lot of noise out there as well. So like, should brands be posting every day? Should brands be posting more on a weekly basis? What would your recommendation be, especially for LinkedIn posts? Yeah, I think my, my view in this, and you will hear different opinions on this, Carlotta, because I don't think there is a one, you know, one rule. My view would be, I think it's quality over quantity. Okay. Um, however, I think you need to balance that with a reasonable level of frequency so that you are not forgotten um, and that you're maintaining visibility amongst your followers and also helping to gain traction with, with prospects. What I would not advocate is a mindset that says I need to post X number of posts per week and you therefore post content that is of poor quality in order to meet that objective okay. because at the end of the day not only would it reflect badly on you as a personal brand or a professional brand or as a business but equally from an algorithm perspective bearing in mind social is, is an art and a science um, those sort of posts are going to underperform um, so there's a there's an aspect in my opinion of well, would it even be worth it um, so i think it's about finding that balance um, and i think that is then one of the challenges that that business owners face and businesses face is around having the time to, to do this and to do this to do this well. Um, but I think it also you need to take a bit of it. It depends on it. Probably sounds like I'm I'm, I'm being non committable in my answer. But I think it is. Um, there is no one size fits all answer. And I think it all it makes a difference whether you're a B two C or B two B and the nature of your follower base and the nature of of, of your brand. Um, so for example, if you're thinking about maybe a a startup style business or maybe a food business that's had to adapt a lot to how it do things during the crisis. It's actually quite a nice story to follow if you that brand were to post on a regular basis around how they're managing to fulfill orders, what sort of response they're getting from their customer base during the crisis. That's quite a nice story to, to take your followers on and to help them be part of that story. And with that would come then probably a, a rhythm of, of daily posting around that sort of content. Okay, so bottom line is quality over quantity because quality will perform better when it comes to algorithm, the algorithm, social media. Absolutely. Algorithm. And then as well as 
engagement with your audience. So your audience will respond better to content that provides value and is authentic rather than just a whole bunch of gibberish on your social channels. Absolutely. And you've hit, you've hit the nail on the head there about value. It really is about value. And it comes back to my earlier point about understanding your audience and what their needs and their pain points are. So you have an understanding of what value means to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And as we've been discussing aspects of that, of course, have changed during the crisis, as I alluded to uh, in the B2C space, uh, consumers have a much greater need for content um, around safety and, and reassurances around that aspect um, of the retail experience. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I think that, as I said, there's no one size fits all answer, but I think um, that's part of the beauty of social is, 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 is it isn't a one size fits all channel. And I think also depending on your sector, Carlotto, you will have audiences that are more active on social and audiences that are less active on social. And that will have an impact on your um, engagement rates as well. Um, And I think at the end of the day, irrespective of how you approach your content, if you are a brand that people love or your followers love because they really believe in the purpose of that brand, then you're in a better position from the very beginning because the people who've chosen to follow you massively believe and are passionate about what you stand for and what your cause is. Mm -hmm. Um, So compare that to, say, maybe a slightly other extreme if you work for maybe a financial services organization where your audience might have a slight mindset that says, you know, you're charging me too high fees or you're not there to help me out when I'm really stuck financially, I'm not saying all financial services brands have that. Um, but they might have a bit of more of a challenging um, situation in respect of having that positivity and that really kind of support uh, from their follower base compared to maybe some other brands. Eva, so let's talk a little bit about social listening. What tools do you use to listen into your channels? I would say um, with social listening, there's probably two ways you can approach this, Carlotta. I think one is probably a more organic approach, which is probably suitable for smaller businesses. Um, and the second approach would be where you actually employ a social listening tool or an enterprise style solution. So I'll touch on the first one, uh, firstly. So in terms of I suppose, basic social listening. Um, I think for me, it would be things like obviously keeping an eye on all your social feeds. So, you know, it's been said, um, setting up a stream so you can keep an eye on what are the interactions against your brand and your various handles and making sure that you're interacting with those pieces of content. Um, But then on the content you can put out, you can actually add tags so you can build up some data and analytics around what content is performing, etc. The second point on that would be, I think, again, for smaller businesses, a really important way of getting insight is participating in groups um, and also making sure you're tracking via your social channels mentions of your brand name. So, again, you can do this quite easily on on Twitter, for example. Um, If you then want to employ a more, I suppose, sophisticated solution, there are lots of different social listening tools that you can procure. Uh, so two that I'm familiar with, one is from an organization called Social Studio and the other is Brand Watch, which is part of Hootsuite. Um, so they would provide you with a much more comprehensive solution that not only gives you insight around what's been said about your brand, but also will really help you to build those insights around what your audiences are interested in. And so you can start to really build that in and use it to that analysis to shape your, your content and the content that you put out on social. Aoife, so basically, if you're on a low budget, there are three main hacks that you can do to listen to your audience. One is by keeping an eye on your newsfeed, because plenty of people put content out that they later don't really see how it's performing on their channels. Two, it's by engaging with people through groups and also tapping into local communities, uh, conversations. And then three as well, following certain hashtags, right, that can give you insights into what your community may be interested in. Exactly. That that would be the advice I would I would give, as you said, if, if you're on a on a low or no budget. What are three LinkedIn marketing tips for increased engagement? I think it probably similar to some of the things I said earlier. I would say firstly, um, really think about what content you're putting out there. Um, what I see a lot of on LinkedIn is people going first to the sales pitch. So as a as a business owner as a sales professional of course your end game is to sell right 
However, if you go onto LinkedIn and you are posting, you know, I've got this amazing offer. If anyone's interested in buying ABC, please connect with me. That's not going to get any traction. You know, and I often say to people, you know, that's, that's probably no better and possibly slightly worse than, you know, pure cold calling. Because at the end of the day, people need to remember the reason why people go onto the platform. They don't go onto the platform to receive sales pitches. Um, the second thing I would say is a little bit around what I alluded to earlier about there's an element of um, science to social media in the sense that once you get to know the algorithm and how it works, you can craft your posts to make it more algorithm friendly. So by that, I mean that the little kind of tips and hacks around how you write something and how you publish it to give it the best possible chance of being served in a newsfeed. Um, so I'll give you one example. Um, it's kind of seems a bit counterintuitive, but on LinkedIn, it's a bad idea to share someone's content. So by that, I mean, so your engagement options on LinkedIn would be to, to like, comment or share, right? On Facebook, share is, is, is a brilliant engagement tool. But ironically, on LinkedIn, from an algorithm perspective, it, it completely bombs. So if you want to give someone's post the maximum opportunity of being seen and really give them a leg up, so to speak, your best thing to do is to like the post and um, comment on it and get, you know, give a well-opinionated, well-crafted comment. Um, so that's kind of a, a bit of an example around how the algorithm works. And the more you understand about that, obviously, the better chance you have for your content to perform. And thirdly, I would say um, another probably mistake that people make is maybe they have too much of a reliance on what I would call first party content. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the beauty of social media is you're not restricted to content that you yourself have produced or created. Um, so definitely consider how you can use third party content or curated content. Um, so look to other news sources, other uh, sources of valuable thought leadership um, materials that are going to be of interest to your audience. But obviously with that, I would say always make sure you're comfortable that the source that you're sharing is credible um, because ultimately it reflects back on your professional brand if you're sharing um, content that that isn't, um, doesn't carry sufficient authority. Um, so they would really be my, my main tips. Okay, Eva, we've been speaking a lot about how to get brands the attention that they need in order to grow. But what about personal brands? I mean, personally, I want to be seen as much as a brand wants to be seen. So what can individuals do to also attract the right attention to their profiles, especially on LinkedIn? Let's focus on LinkedIn. That's a really good question, Carlotta, because I think, as we mentioned earlier, more people are on the platform, but equally, there's a lot of people probably sitting there going, I'm not sure how to do this. So I would say, firstly, if you see a piece of content uh, that you like and you found useful, interesting, then it's great that you view it. But in order to give that piece of content maximum chance of being seen and served to other people, do take a second to like it. Um, and also, from your own perspective, it's great if you actually take a few moments to even comment on that piece of content because that gives you as a user on LinkedIn the opportunity also to be seen um, because when you do take the time to leave a well-crafted um, comment on someone else's post that demonstrates your expertise in the field that you want to be known for well then that is going to help drive views to your profile um, which again can help build your network in terms of people reaching out to you proactively wanting to connect with you. So there's definitely a win-win there by, by participating and being active in how you engage on LinkedIn. Okay, excellent. So basically more of the story, comment on posts, and that will also drive traffic to your personal profile. Absolutely. Okay, excellent. I'll keep that in mind for my LinkedIn activity. Okay, Aoife, I do want to talk a little bit about how you would respond to the haters of this world. How would you advise brands and people to respond to comments, negative comments on their social media accounts? What should a brand do? Do you have any, any like practical examples of what you've seen done already? So it's an example from the UK. So apologies to our international audience who may not get this as easily. Um, and it was an example surrounding a brand called Yorkshire Tea. Now, for those not in the UK, tea is a big thing in the UK, and Yorkshire Tea is one of the biggest tea brands. Um, and it started off with quite an innocent tweet from the Chancellor. 
um, so Member of Parliament, who had tweeted a photo with a big bag of Yorkshire tea saying he was making a brew for the team. So he thought he was just putting out there a very innocent tweet showing that he was a team player making cups of tea for his team. Little did he know it was going to turn into a Twitter storm. <laughs> and it basically turned into this Twitter storm because people have got high emotions around politics, particularly during the COVID crisis. And it led to a massive um, Twitter conversation around uh, people's um, disgruntlement around certain government policies and Yorkshire Tea, because it was um, featured in the photo, but not tagged in the post, got brought into the conversation. So as a brand, they were in a very tricky position because unwittingly they had been brought into a Twitter storm, which was very negative and very uh, emotive in terms of how people were playing out those conversations on Twitter. Um, and I'm calling this out because I think it really shows how a brand can respond to this situation in a very clever way and also be true to their brand. Um, so basically Yorkshire Tea, they, they replied very nicely saying, you know, we, we, this was not brand promotion on our behalf. You know, we're really happy to see the Chancellor consuming our tea, but we were not part of this. When that didn't dumb down the, the, the Twitter storm, um, they actually ended up replying to, there was one particular tweeter who got very, very irate. Um, and after being nice and calm and polite and all the rest of it, I thought it was so funny that the community manager replied in the end um, with a tweet that said, addressed the tweeter, who was called Sue, and said, Sue, you're shouting at tea. And I was trying to try and make the person realize how out of proportion their behavior was because they were having this political rant at a tea brand. And I think also what I loved about this story was so many people on Twitter backed up the brand and they were saying to these people who were going crazy, you know, calm down, you know, this, this is a tea brand. What are you doing? Right. Um, so I found that an incredible story. And I think, it, you know, from a brand mentions perspective, I think their brand mentions spiked to something like 175,000 on, on Twitter. Um, so for anyone who's interested to, to actually see what the creatives and what the responses look like, um, it's featured on my LinkedIn profile under my previous activity. But I just thought that was a wonderful example of a brand dealing with a PR crisis. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. It's a great story and a great example. Okay, and now moving into one of our last questions of today's interview. Do you have any practical examples of campaigns or projects that you've led or that you've seen done across your social media channels that have just really resonated with you? Sure, yes, yeah, so I suppose one example I wanted to highlight is, and again, it just brings to life some of the points we discussed earlier, was when I was working with a client who were putting out regular um, video uh, content on their social channels in the in the B2C uh, financial services space. Um, and a lot of time went in from the client's perspective in producing these videos, a lot of thought in terms of the content. But the problem that came to it was that videos, it was felt they weren't performing as well on social as what they would have expected. Mm -hmm. And that was despite investment in paid social. And what I found when I looked at what they had been doing was a couple of things. I think one was the videos were not subtitled. And I think we all know now that is a must have, um, partly because on certain social platforms, videos will play as automatically muted. And also depending where people are, they're, you know, they're not in a position to have sound on. So subtitles are a must have. Secondly, what I found was a lot of the videos were quite long. Um, so, and that kind of goes into my third point, was that typically if you like the hook or the really most valuable piece of, of the story that they were producing would be at the end of the video. But if most people were not getting to the end of the video, they were never gonna to get to that piece of content. So it was really that sharing that best practice around how do you front load the hook of your story? Um, and I'm sure this will resonate with, with content marketers um, everywhere is thinking about, you know, how do you craft your video content so that you're giving enough of a hook up front so people are going to stick around um, but you're doing it in a way that obviously works for how that piece of content is going to unfold. Okay. Um, so we found once we made those changes to the content it had a you know did have a massive increase on on the performance of, of, of the content um, and I think they are best practices that that other content marketeers could, could hopefully benefit from. 
Okay, Aoife, and to finish up today's interview, I'm going to ask you about the future of social. Companies are expected to spend $120 billion in digital marketing by 2021. So that's right around the corner, Aoife. And obviously, a big chunk of this will be spent on social networks. So with that in mind, what do you think the future of social media will look like? That's a really interesting question. And I think, you know, anyone trying to predict the future now, it, it, it's, it's immensely difficult because nobody could have anticipated how this year was going to unfold. But what I can say is I think the increases we've seen in spend on social media, I definitely think they're here to stay. So to put that into some context for you, um, according to the CMO survey, published um, in June, mm -hmm. social media spend on paid social reached an all-time high of 23% of total marketing budgets compared to previously it was running at about 13%. Now obviously that spend level varies a lot by sector etc but it just gives you an insight into the massive increase uh, we've seen in terms of investment in social channels um, partly because of traditional advertising and other marketing outlets not being as suitable during this pandemic but i definitely believe that once marketers see the value they're getting from social over and above purely seeing it as a channel that drives leads and sales those additional value points we've touched on that increased investment is definitely here to stay i think combined with that it's been driven by the fact that we are seeing people spending more time on social platforms the choice of social platforms we've got has grown. You know, I'm not going to start talking about TikTok, but obviously that's not on everyone's lips. So I think those two dynamics together has really cemented the place of social in terms of being a very, very important uh, channel for marketers. Um, I think I'd also like to touch on the role of individuals and of employees in social as well, because I think we all know about the demise of organic social. Um, but I think also with this pandemic, what we've seen is the huge importance of that human to human connectivity and really humanization of brands. And I think in my view, one of the most powerful ways in which brands can do that is by really enabling their employees to be the voice of the brand on social um, and to be able to share uh, messages, content, etc., that helps them uh, promote their brand, but they're doing it in the voice of the employee. And one of the other reasons I say that is so important and powerful is that we know when it comes to trust, people trust people more than they do faces corporate brands. That kind of seems just intuitive to us, but it's certainly backed up by the data saying, I think it's the Edelman Trust Barometer uh, COVID report from 2020 has actually said that people trust industry experts and people like themselves much more so to the tune of 60% and 59% respectively. Um, so it goes without saying that um, brands should really be enabling and training their employees to, to be more present on, on social. Okay. I would add, uh, from my personal experience, I look at social more as an event. Like when I go to an event, I go to several different booths, right? I go to one booth to get information from about XYZ sector or XYZ brand. I go to a different booth to meet XYZ type of personality type of person. Then I go to a networking event in the afternoon to socialize and make new friends. So like social for me is kind of like an event. You can go to different channels and pick up different information, make new friends, network with different types of people, uh, also learn from the influencers and stuff like that. It's not just a sales tool. It is much more of a community, right? You're talking to a community and from that community, you can gain valuable insights. You can make new friends. You can make new connections. There's just so much to social. Absolutely. I think that's really a really good analogy. And I think, you know, um, I think it's a really exciting time. So, you know, watch this space, as we like to say. Definitely. Well, Aoife, thank you so much for joining us on the Content Mix. It was awesome to meet you and to pick your brain on social and what the social media entails for the future. Thank you so much, Carlotta, for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. And the pleasure has been mine. And to everybody listening in today, thank you for joining us on the Content Mix. For more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, check out The Content Mix. We'll be releasing interviews just like this one every week, so keep on tuning in. Thanks again, have a fabulous day, and see you next time. Bye.